Welcome to Carbon's DIY Garage. I've got the Chrysler 200 uh, back up on jack stands, and the reason for that is actually about 20 miles after I drove away from the car lot, they got a uh, check engine light with a P0128 engine code. And of course, 20 miles away from the lot means that it had it while it was on the lot, but uh, they had erased the code, so I didn't pick it up on my scan tool, and it wasn't showing when I did the test drive, but Anyway, that's a uh, under temperature of the coolant, so it's below the engine operating uh, temperature and it can't get it up to temperature. And that could be because of a coolant temperature sensor or because the thermostat is failed open and you're constantly flowing uh, coolant through the engine, keeping the engine too cool. On the engine temperature gauge, also seeing it never getting up to the halfway mark, it goes to about the quarter mark. So I've already replaced the engine coolant temperature sensor because that's easy and you don't have to drain the coolant and I made a video on that and it's linked up here in the corner and then in the video description. That did not fix the problem. So the only other option is to replace the thermostat, which is pretty simple on my Jeeps, not so much on this car. So the thermostat housing is uh, this big black plastic here. There's two outlets that goes, I assume, to the heater core, radiator inlet outlet, and uh, there's actually some seals to the engine itself um, on the side. And there's actually two thermostats. One is in here in this top housing, and one is between the engine and the plastic housing. So if you're gonna replace just the thermostats, make sure you get two of them and they're different sizes. But uh, for about 55 bucks, you can get this entire housing. It comes with both thermostats. It comes with all the seals that you need to replace. So I think that's a pretty good deal, even though this piece of plastic is probably just fine. I'm gonna go ahead and replace the whole thing, drain the coolant, um, do all that maintenance. And if I'm doing it, may as well show you how it's done and uh, whatever tips and tricks I learned from working on this uh, 2.4 liter dual VVT engine to replace the uh, coolant uh, thermostats. So let's go ahead and get started. Like I said, I've got the vehicle up on jack stands already. Um, and as I've mentioned in uh, previous videos, there are a lot of plastic closeouts underneath uh, this car when it comes from the factory, but at some point, some previous owner or shop took all those out and tossed them away. Um, you are going to have to be able to access the pet cock or the drain cock or the drain valve of the radiator, and that is located right here. And the only way to do that really is to remove the plastic, um, big plastic piece that normally connects to the bumper. It's got a lot of um, trim uh, push pins and bolts, if I remember right from videos I've seen. And then I think there's another plastic piece that covers like the engine oil, the oil pan and the oil filter that you're gonna have to take off as well. So I don't have to do any of that. I can't show it to you, I apologize for that. But first thing we're gonna have to do is get a bucket and um, some tubing to go into that bucket so I can drain the radiator, open the pet cock, and uh, that is the drain valve, or the drain hole. I've got the radiator cap on tight still, and of course the engine is completely cold. You do not want to do this with the engine hot because the system will still be under pressure. But uh, with the radiator cap on, the flow coming out of the drain should be slower so that uh, it's easier to manage, make sure it's all going into the right spot. All right, well, that's a mess. Uh, the pet cock just completely came out of the hole in the radiator, so it's not fun, but at least it's draining. And uh, I was gonna replace the pet cock anyway, so um, yeah, I guess we'll try that. Well, that was very surprising and frustrating. Um, I didn't get it on camera because I'm trying to save my camera, but uh, I went up and opened the radiator cap to see if I could get the rest of this to drain and didn't really think that through because the radiator completely gushed empty out both the uh, drain hole and also the hole where the pet cock goes and just put it kind of all over the garage and the camera. So I missed getting that on video, apologize, but a little bit frustrated of the mess. All right, so looking at the factory 
cock valve and the replacement here I've already bought, uh, they are identical. So I think what that means is that if you open this, um, it's a fine working, this one's just not sealing, so it's getting a little bit of drips out the hole. But if, if you have a fine working petcock valve and you turn it more than a quarter turn, this is actually just gonna come out of the radiator and you're gonna have a huge mess. So um, lesson learned, when you go to open it, this is closed, this is open, and don't go any further than that or it's gonna actually come out, so. Next up is to remove the air box. To do that, you've got one fastener here, I think it's 10 millimeter. You've got one trim push pin uh, over here, and then you've got to uh, remove the air vent line, the snorkel, and this electrical connector, and then it should uh, pull straight up. There is one more fastener down here at the bottom of the box that you also have to remove. It's the same fastener size as the uh, worm clamp on the snorkel, which is, um, I'm using 5 16 I think it's either eight or seven millimeter if you're using metric, but uh, gotta remove that as well. Let me show you what I discovered with this air box. Uh, I told you there's a eight millimeter fastener here you need to remove and um, Actually, I don't think that's true because uh, there's another one back here that really it's probably possible, but really challenging to get that socket onto. But when I pulled up on the air box, it just uh, lifted out. And I'll show you that in a second, but this is the other fastener that I was talking about uh, down here on the rail. And I think what's supposed to happen is that both of these stay, you don't need to remove them and uh, you've got these rubber grommets on the air box and I think you are supposed to be able to just pull up uh, probably a pretty pretty strong pull and pull this these two posts through the rubber grommets and then when you go to reinstall it you just uh, push this back down on top of these grommets and that's what holds it in place. Uh, I've already removed this one so I'm not gonna try that. Uh, we'll just go ahead and leave it like this but I think you can probably get away with remo not removing either of these fasteners and just pull up uh, pretty, top, pretty hard on the airbox to get it to come out. So depending on how you manage those two grommets, uh, once you've got everything up here taken care of, either remove the front uh, post like I did or uh, leave them both and then just pull up really hard and it should come out just like this. And you just set it aside. The next step before you can physically remove the plastic housing from the engine is to uh, disconnect the four hoses, two for the heater core, two for the radiator, and this electrical connector. I of course have a bucket uh, or a pan underneath the engine. I expect there to be fluid. Well, I know there's fluid still in this housing, uh, probably in the hoses as well. So I wanna capture all of that so it doesn't go all over the garage floor, even though at this point, does it really matter? But uh, we'll try to collect of it, as much of it as we can. Before I go ahead and take these t hoses off of the housing, I want to make sure I know which one goes where. So the easiest thing for me is that the top hose coming out of the firewall goes to the top of the housing. The bottom hose from the firewall goes to the bottom part of the housing. So yep, all of the coolant in the housing is flowing out of that bottom. Um, outlet because uh, the car's jacked up. So I do have a bin underneath there to catch everything. So this is fun to watch it drip. There is still fluid in the heater core hoses. So you make sure you tuck them up. Um, maybe behind another hose or something so that the uh, heater core doesn't empty onto the floor as well. Now we're ready to fully uh, physically disconnect the housing from the engine. There are 10 millimeter bolts. There's one here that you can see, another one here that you can see, and then a third one is uh, back right here where my finger is on the other side of this plastic rib. 
and you just need to back those out. Remember, there's probably still fluid in here. Um, also, there's a tube from the engine going into the housing, so you need to uh, rock the housing a bit and then pull it uh, pretty much straight away from the engine to uh, get it to come off smoothly. Like I said, coolant, coolant everywhere. Uh, so this is the tube coming out of the engine that I was talking about, and you saw when I was taking the housing off, twisting around this O-ring to get the housing off. So that's what you're gently pulling against, just working it free of this O-ring, and you need to replace this O-ring. And that comes with the kit for the housing. This is where that second thermostat mounts, um, and this is uh, a mounting surface, obviously, and this is also a gasket on the housing goes against this surface so before we install the new housing we want to make sure we clean the engine block off in these two locations and then also replace this o-ring keep in mind that this is an aluminum block so you do not want to make scratches or gouges into it or you're going to have sealing problems with your new gaskets now i'm just going to put some brake parts cleaner on a shop rag and just wipe the surface clean and in the inside surfaces as well to make sure that there's no debris getting into the coolant. Now that the surfaces are clean, I'm going to pull the old o-ring off, clean that surface and then put the new o-ring on. And like I said, the kit that I got for the plastic housing, and there's a link to this in the video description as well. It comes with the housing, both of the thermostats, one of them's installed, one of them you've got to install yourself, and I'll show you that. Uh, an O-ring for right here, and then also a new O-ring for your coolant temperature sensor, and I'll show you that in a little bit as well. But I'm gonna go ahead and take this O-ring off and put the new one on. Just to show you guys what to expect, this is the pool of coolant that uh, has leaked out from the housing is just sitting on top of the transmission that I'm going to have to get out. I'm going to try to get most of it out uh, before I put the new housing in. Here's the old housing with the old thermostat still installed and here is the new housing. You can see they look the same. Um, comes with a new gasket here for the engine. The new thermostat is here. The o-ring for the coolant temperature sensor comes with the kit as well. You will have to transfer your old temperature sensor over to the new housing and I'll show you how to do that. So the other thermostat is actually right here between this bolted interface. So if you only wanted to change this thermostat and you knew that this was the one that was bad, um, I think you could probably just drain the coolant, take this hose off and disconnect this interface, replace that thermostat. Um, probably still have to take the air box off and everything, but uh, yeah, if you know that this one's failed, then you could probably do that as long as you knew what size thermostat to get. But I'm gonna go ahead and take it apart and just show you uh, the two thermostats out of here. Well, I think I found my problem with my cooling issues. This is supposed to be a thermostat, but it's just a through passage for fluid. There is no spring or poppet or anything like uh, this one has. You can see that the, the top is kind of similar and obviously they're different sizes, but it is missing this whole bottom part. And um, I'm gonna show you, it looks like it is completely broken off. Uh, it actually looks burned um, or singed or, or got heated up, I don't know. But uh, it is not in here, and it is not in here, so I don't know where those missing parts may have gone over time, but uh, 
Yeah, I mean, the engine's working fine, and it's not like it traveled somewhere causing a blockage in the fluid system. It should be in this housing somewhere. So maybe previous owner did something? I really don't know, but um, very, very interesting. And I guess in the long run, if I'd have known that, I could just replace this thermostat and save myself a little bit of money, but I'm gonna go ahead and replace this whole housing anyway because I don't know what damage may have been done to it or anything else um, with this thing being broken. Very interesting. All right, we need to transfer the coolant temperature sensor from the old unit to the new one. And it's really simple to do. There's a metal tang right here. Just use a small screwdriver to lift it up and then you turn it counterclockwise. And you just lift up. And you might need to use a screwdriver to help pry it up. You're pulling against an O-ring. There we go. Like I mentioned in the beginning of this video, I actually replaced this coolant temperature sensor first to see if this was causing my problem, which obviously we know now it wasn't. But since this is brand new, the O-ring is brand new, I am not going to replace the O-ring. But uh, if your coolant temperature sensor is not brand new and the O-ring is not brand new, just uh, peel this one off, use the new one that comes in the kit, and um, get a little bit of soapy water or coolant on the O-ring, and then we'll go ahead and install it in the new housing. The sensor goes in just the same way it came out, line up the keyways, and then you turn it clockwise until that metal tang snaps into place. And that's it, now it's locked in place and we're good to go on to the next step. So next we'll go ahead and install the new thermostat and you can see there's a notch in the housing and it lines up with the notch on the um, gasket and then we remember from when we pulled the old one out or looking at the old one we know that uh, this side actually faces out of the housing uh, and this spring side faces into the housing that's really important to get that right so we just line this up and press it into place Next is to put the housing back physically onto the engine. The directions from the manufacturer of the housing says to lubricate the O-rings with soapy water. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, both the O-ring here and then also the gasket for the thermostat. Remember that you're putting bolts into aluminum. You do not want to cross thread these. You do not want to over torque them and break them. Getting them out will be a real pain. So be really careful, go slow. The running torque on this back one is gonna be harder than these other two. And I think, at least it was for me. And I think that's because uh, you're actually pushing the housing over top of that O-ring. And so you're getting it fully seated. So you have to overcome that. Just go slow. And um, I use my finger back here to feel the gap between the head of the bolt and the housing, make sure that it was still closing that gap and uh, not breaking the bolt or anything like that. So once you get them snug with your wrench, you need to then torque it and it goes to 159 inch pounds. Please don't use foot pounds, 159 inch pounds.
With the bolts torqued down, then it's a matter of reconnecting our hoses, and we'll start with the back bottom, back top, front bottom, front top. Don't forget to connect the electrical connector to your coolant temperature sensor. All right, so quick scan of the area. The new housing is installed. The thermostat is properly placed here. Everything is torqued down. Temperature sensor is installed and connected. All the hoses have their clamps installed. And what else? Oh, we also checked the gasket that's in the middle of this housing that goes up against the engine. Uh, that gasket was in place before we put the housing on and that's the, the engine itself was clean, ready for the housing. So I think we're in good shape here. We can close out the area by reinstalling the airbox now. Reinstalling the airbox is just like how you took it out. Uh, if you removed one or both of these fasteners, you're going to have to bolt those back in. If not, you could just press these down over the grommets down over those posts and then uh, uh, reconnect everything. And that's about it. Back under the vehicle again, now I just need to install my new radiator drain uh, petcock valve and then we'll be able to fill up the radiator. So to install the new one, it's really as simple as putting it in with this uh, vertical and then uh, turning it 180 degrees and then it'll be sealed. And that's it, you get that 180 degree turn and it'll hit a hard stop and it's fully sealed. And you can see that the dripping has stopped from the radiator drain, which is also a good sign. All right, the vehicle is back on the ground. The petcock is installed and tight. Everything is reconnected. So now it's time to fill up the radiator. I have this awkwardly too long funnel because I can't find any of my smaller funnels. It's really important that you use the right formula of coolant in these vehicles. This particular vehicle uses a Mopar spec of MS12106. You can see it right there. But uh, really, it's just the OAT formulation. Uh, there are other vehicles like my Jeep Wrangler, the 2011, that uses HOAT. And that is not what you want in this vehicle. You want the OAT. And I'll put a link in the description of the coolant that I'm using. So we'll go ahead and just fill it up to start with until it's. Uh, up to the top here of the radiator fill. So if you fill it too fast and you end up overfilling it like I just did, you're gonna end up with some of it on the floor, so have a pan underneath. But now that it's full, I'll go ahead and start the engine and wait for it to start warming up and open up those thermostats. Before we start the car, do a quick scan underneath and see if you have any obvious leak uh, coming out of your drain or the side of that housing or anything like that before you start uh, adding more flow pass. So far, so good for me. At this point, I'm monitoring the level of the coolant and also squeezing the hoses a little bit to help get air bubbles out. Adding coolant uh, if it drops below the neck of the radiator. I've also turned the heat on inside the car. It's on full hot, set to the face vents with a medium fan speed. So that way uh, fluid is circulating through the heater core as well, working to get all the bubbles out of there as well. So the coolant level is pretty much stable now, although air bubbles every now and again are coming out. But once the engine gets up to temperature, which takes about 10 minutes, then the thermostats should open and they'll start moving coolant around uh, through the whole system. So you'll probably see the coolant level drop, more air bubbles, and be ready to add more coolant when that happens. You're also watching the coolant temperature gauge inside the car to make sure it does not go above middle on that temperature gauge because that means the engine is starting to overheat. You definitely do not want that. So keep an eye on the temperature gauge and also this fluid level. All right, my friends, um, you didn't get to see some of this. I showed you how I was filling up and squeezing out and getting air bubbles out. 
but um, after 15 minutes of letting the car idle, it was not warming up at anywhere past like up this level. And so then I put the radiator cap on and waited a few minutes more and it just wasn't heating up at all. So then um, the coolant overflow tank is full. So I went and started driving it around because that was the only way I, I could think of to, e either the engine was gonna overheat and there's something else preventing the flow of the coolant or this motor is just really efficient at cooling without the coolant, I don't know. But anyway, I went and started driving around and just by driving around the neighborhood, I could get it up to about, just a little bit below where it's at right now. And that's still not the halfway mark. So I brought it back into the garage and I sat here for maybe five minutes with it at 2,500 to 3,000 RPM. And it finally got the motor up warm enough to being at the halfway mark. And um, so that, that's good. That means the thermostats should be open. And hopefully you can hear me over the car running, but one thing I was doing, I was showing you, I was squeezing these upper radiator hoses and now, now they're super hot um, to get the bubbles out. And I was also squeezing this lower radiator hose to get bubbles out. Um, and it was cool to the touch um, before I went out and started driving around. Uh, like I said, I came back in the garage, got it up to 2,500, 3,000 RPM until the temperature gauge was in the middle. And now this hose is solid. It's got fluid locked in it and it is super hot. So the thermostats are open, everything's running the way it should, and um, I think now we are in good shape. Um, I don't know if every Chrysler 200 with this 2.4 liter dual VBT is like that, and it just runs uh, cool. Is that a thing? Leave a comment if you know that that's how these things go. But at least I know that uh, the thermostats are good, the coolant temperature sensor is good, the engine has good cooling and um, so this video may turn out a little bit longer than uh, it really needs to be but i learned a few things along the way hopefully you found it helpful if you have any comments or questions leave it in the comments section um, parts that i used i will put in the video description with links and um, yeah that'll wrap up this video if you like it give it a thumbs up subscribe to the channel and uh, we will see you next time on the next video more to come i'm sure have a good one